Dr. Jack Burks. Oops. I've enjoyed meeting all of you. And I also want to express to you how much I admire your courage as you go through life's adventure with multiple sclerosis. It's a very courageous, uh, it brings out courage in people, I think. And I've witnessed that this week again and again. And I also want to thank the caregivers and the care partners. Uh, this ain't easy. Uh, and, that, um, and that your efforts to make life's journey a little smoother is very much appreciated. My advice to the care partners, you heard it yesterday uh, from Laura, you're going to hear it from me, take care of yourself as well. Uh, do the best you can to keep yourself healthy so you'll be around for a long, long time to be uh, the excellent care partners that you are. Um, and um, I just want to wish you all the best, and I want to wish great, great speed for those scientists and healthcare professionals who have dedicated their lives to finding the answers to multiple sclerosis to make your life a little uh, less rough, a little less wavy as uh, on the cruise. So uh, it's, this is my uh, final presentation, and it's a, it's a little, um, uh, it's a little uh, personal. This is my perspective. I've been doing this, I've been a specialist in multiple sclerosis since 1973. That's a long time ago. I've seen lots of interesting things happen in those uh, times. And, and so I have per certain perspectives that I've picked up along the way. And I thought I would show, share with you sort of a, my personal perspective as a neurologist taking care of multiple sclerosis patients. And maybe there'll be something in here that you'll find worthwhile. But we, it's entitled, um, let me take this over here, uh, Maximizing Health and Wellness. I'm really not going to talk about medicines today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, these key learning objectives. So, <clears throat> So as a neurologist, what, what do I think are the steps to better health, wellness, and happiness? Number one is stay educated. Keep updated on your knowledge about multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's a fascinating field. It's a difficult field. I only do one disease, multiple sclerosis. I'm a neurologist, but I only do one disease. I can't keep up. <laughs> uh, it is so, there was a meeting a couple months ago, over a thousand papers all on multiple sclerosis. Uh, that I reviewed for a publication. Actually, that publication is um, something you might be interested in. I, as you know, I'm the chief medical officer of the MSAA. I work with all the MS organizations. Um, and we do a research update. And this year, the, the lead author was Stephen Krieger from uh, Mount Sinai in New York. And I get, had the opportunity to review and help edit all that material. It's about a 55-page uh, update on research for what's happened in 2013. It'll be on the MSA's website in about a week or two. Uh, I'm the one who held it up because <laughs> I had to do the final review. But it's, it's done. I finished it before I left. And uh, you might find it interesting. It's written for the lay person. But it is so good. And Dr. Krieger did such a good job that uh, top-notch neurologists all over the world, when they see me at meetings, say thank you for that. I read it as soon as it comes out. <laughs> I said, well, it's not meant for you. They says, it is, it is, it is easy to read, it's a lot of material, but it's, it's a short burst, and it's very helpful. So you might want to keep that in mind. Uh, in about a week or so, that'll be available. And it's also, it's also a pamphlet, it's also a brochure, so it'll, it'll go out in written form as well. If you want to find out what's happening in MS over the last 12 months, it's a nice review. And it has essentially everything I talked about as far as the new treatments for, for progressive MS in it. Um, and so you can get much more information than I could give you um, yesterday. Excuse me, where do we go again for that? The Multiple Sclerosis Association of America. It's called the MSAA. Just Google MSAA. Um, and, uh, and again, it should be, should be ready in about a week. Actually, now probably less than a week. Um, second, 
there's a concept that I want to share with you, which I think is probably the most important thing I have today, is how to, uh, a key to your well-being. And that's something called shared decision-making. And I'm going to talk to you about the concept of shared decision-making and challenge you to be part of this. It is, MS is not a disease that, well, I'll just do what the doctor says. You know, whatever he prescribes is what I'll do. I don't have to know much about it. I'll just take it. He wants me to get a pill shot. I don't care. I'm just going to do it. That's not the way to handle your disease. And what we found is that when um, we tell people what they should take, so, well, I'm your doctor. Take this. The adherence to those medications is actually pretty low. When we actually go through a shared decision-making process where we discuss things with the patient and we get their ideas, um, uh, it, the adherence to drugs is, is, is much greater. Why is that? Well, it's because what doctors want out of a drug is actually not the same as what patients want out of a drug. You know, as a neurologist, the, the one thing on top of my mind, I, I should not mind, my colleague's mind, is what's the most effective? You know, the, I want the pow most powerful drug I can give because that means there'll be less attacks and, and less problems in the future, and that's all that really matters for the most part. The rest of this is the 10%. If you ask patients, they say, well, these drugs are pretty much the same, you know, in many things, and so I want one that, that I can take what my convenience for me. Like there was a person yesterday when the Copaxone announcement was made saying, uh, instead of taking Copaxone every day, I get to take it three times a week. I'm not sure that's a good thing for me. I may want it once a day because there's a ritual. I never forget when I take it once a day, but if I have to remember it three times a week, I might start forgetting my medicine. It's funny, you don't think about As a doctor, I never think about that stuff. Uh, but they think about safety. Well, you know, what's going to happen? Am I going to get um, uh, bad infections? Am I going to get cancer? Am I going to? We don't know what's going to happen. These drugs have only been out for a couple of years. That's really an important issue for me. I want something that I have long-term safety. Oh yeah, but this is better. It's it's more effective. Well, one of the reasons these drugs may be more effective is that people take them. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that Tasabri, Tasabri is a great drug, uh, but you have to take. You have to take your Tisabri. You get this notice. You've got to be at the infusion center. So guess what? People don't forget their Tisabri. Uh, not, that's not the same for the other drugs. So, I, so we're going to talk about shared decision making for a little bit this morning. And another thing I want to challenge you, in a way it's, it's the same sort of concept of shared decision making becoming et, uh, knowledgeable, is getting non-medical help. We're talking about employment issues, financial issues, insurance issues, uh, support systems. And you've heard about some of those this week. Uh, but use the knowledge that you're getting and the strategy you're giving for shared decision making medically to get to make this better decisions in non-medical issues. And uh, try to keep from losing your individual identity. Each of us are special. And we remain, each of us, special. We remain individuals, whether we have multiple sclerosis or not. And it's important that we keep our individuality. And, and then maintaining physical and emotional health. We talk a lot about the physical health. Uh, but if you have good physical health and you don't have good mental health, you know, I'm not sure how, how, how much your quality of life is going to be that much better. So think about emotional health as well as physical health. And I'm going to give you, at the end of this, I'm going to give you my, the 10 steps to higher quality of life. And so we'll talk about those as well. So that's what I'm hoping to do this morning. So let's talk about shared management. This is a big slide, and I apologize for it. But um, there's a lot of material on it. Is that most people think that, well, shared management is really self-management. I need to take care of myself. And, and that's sort of important, because you have to be responsible for your own self. But it's not like... Uh, taking over your care. It's sharing your care. And it's a philosophy and a planning strategy uh, where uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new way of thinking about how to navigate your day-to-day -day challenges, both medical and non-medical, non with the goal of a better quality of life. And it allows the, the you don't, 
I bet you don't think about this, but I do. It allows the patients the opportunity to bring their unique, quote, insider's perspective to their specific MS issues and bring it to the attention of their healthcare professionals because we have our own set things. We, this is what we do. One, two, three, four, five. We've been trained for years, but we're missing something. We're missing the patient's perspective because all we're knowing is what the textbook and what, what our professors may have told us, but it's really the, the final end of whether you do something or not is your decision, not the doctor's decision. And if the doctor understands your insider's perspective, guess what? They'll change the way they look at it as well. So between the two of you, you'll reach a better decision than either of you individually. And remember, there's no one size that fits all therapy. All these drugs work for certain people and none of these drugs work for certain people and you've got to figure out what's the best and that's the discussion you need to have with your physician. What's the best fit for me? Because I know that one size does not fit all. And it's, it's a learned skill. It's not something we're born with. So you have to, you, you have to uh, learn in many ways and you have to learn the technology and the, and the tools of how to do this. You've got to learn where to get the information so you're a better consumer of your own health care. And that could be the internet. A lot of people go to the internet. Be careful about the internet. It, uh, you have to go to reputable sources. And the MS organizations are the best of the reputable sources. Taking cruises, that's a good idea, uh, and, 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 and talking to me personally over lunch or dinner or whatever, uh, going to, to the websites of the major MS organizations are very important. And uh, if somebody wants to sell you something on the internet, beware. So the internet is not the answer to everything. Be really careful your, your source from the internet. And, that, uh, and also the last thing was that the strategies of shared management are important in non-medical as well as medical issues. So what are the goals? Well, my goal when I talk about shared management is to change uh, from crisis management to preventive strategies. And there have been three people on this cruise this week who've had sort of heat stroke sort of things. Uh, and I'm glad to see you're here. <laughs> I'm glad you look really good this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and so, in shared management, you, you talk, you learn about what are the issues, what are the potential pitfalls, so you can prevent them. And that goes for many areas of multiple sclerosis. And then self-reliance, one of the goals is that self-reliance and confidence replaces doubt. Because a lot of us are doubtful about what we're doing and things like that. Well, shared management says, okay, I'm now in charge. I know what's going on, and it's important for me. And shared communication replaces miscommunication. I can't tell you how much miscommunication goes on between, between healthcare professionals and patients. Well, I think they said this. And they both say, the doctor says, well, I think the patient said this. When the patient says, no, I said this. Uh, so therefore, if you're sharing the decision, and, and Mark is going to talk more about that this afternoon, I'm sure, about the communication skills. Uh, but I see it all part of, of sharing the burden of multiple sclerosis so it's less for everyone concerned. And shared decision replaces whatever the doctor says. It's, it's passe. Whatever, whatever the doctor says is probably good for that doctor, but that doctor probably doesn't have multiple sclerosis, and you really need to have your input into this and buy into it, take ownership and say, yes, I'm going to make this happen. And, uh, and patient pri prioritization of their issues really should guide my recommendations. What they think is important for them is probably more important than what I think may be important for them, at least at that moment. So how does it work? First of all, be prepared. We talked about the internet. We talked about, um, what I want to talk about is quantifying your problems. If you just list your problems, that's one thing. But if you say, this is my priority issue, this is really affecting my quality of life the most. And, um, um, and I think that's important to say, how important is this? Because if you look, most of my patients have 10 problems. Uh, and uh, so try to quantify them if at all possible. And so, um, 
Let me give you an example. Um, the, um, um, if you tell your doctor I've got bladder problems, he'll probably, I'm going to use bladder as an example for the next few slides, okay? Uh, he'll probably say, oh, okay, well, good luck. <laughs> uh, and, um, and then what you've got to say is, well, doctor, I would need more than luck here. I mean, I'm really concerned. There are serious issues with my bladder. Here's what I'm concerned about, infections. Social isolation. I don't go out. I, do you know that, doctor? I don't go. To, I don't go to the movies. I don't go to restaurants anymore because of that. Uh, do you know, doctor? I can't sleep because I'm up two or three times going to bed. I'm tired at work the next day because of it. And you know, doctor, uh, my spouse and I have not had sexual relationships for a while because of my bladder problems because I'm afraid I'll leak. And um, and the. Uh, and I'm really constipated because the medicine you gave me for my bladder caused me to be severely constipated. So my bladder's a little bit better, but it's really affecting. These are serious issues for me, doctor. So pay attention and try to figure out what you can do to help me, doctor, because these are my concerns and these are my issues and they're high priority for me. Um, the other thing is when you're, like, like for the bladder, there's a, symptom, there's a symptom questionnaire for bladder, which I think is on these slides. Yeah, there is. I, I put one in here. Uh, where you can actually get online and fill out issues related to the bladder that are validated for MS patients. And if you, ser if you score a certain number on those, you really need help. And if a patient comes to me and says, you know, I'm having bladder problems, and I blow them off. If they give me a questionnaire that they score a certain number, I say, oh, boy, I better pay attention to this one. So yeah, this is really important. First of all, this patient took the time to fill out a questionnaire. So I know it's important. You get the idea of what I'm talking about here? And also try to get to, the, try to, get to your points quickly. And I'll talk about that toward the end. Um, and because I, sometimes patients will come in and I'll have like a half an hour, 40 minutes with them and, and they'll talk about lots of different things. And, um, and, um, uh, and they sort of talk what's important to them. And I'm, I've got this list of things I want to talk about, and they've got, you know, they're talking about this stuff. And they don't get to the point very quickly. And sometimes I'll walk them out to the waiting room, which I do. And uh, they'll say, oh, by the way, doctor, as they're getting ready to sign out, uh, I'm going to have to tell you about X, Y, and Z. <laughs> I say, well, we're a long way from the examining room here, but so maybe we should have another appointment because we can't really handle that in front of, in the waiting room in front of patients. Uh, so make a list. What do you need to talk about? Get to the point quickly. And when you leave, you'll check, check your list and say, OK, I've got my issues covered. People say, you never take lists to doctor's office. It, it insults them. That's not true. I love it when patients come lists and say, OK, let's go through the list. Let's prioritize the list. What do you want to start with? It's amazing how much quickly we can cover a lot of ground. Um, and, then, and then what happens, we spend time talking about it. And then people leave without specific recommendations, without what are their options. Well, we've talked about your bladder. We'll use that as an example. But you know, there are numerous other symptoms that are like this. And, uh, and we haven't gotten to the point. Well, and this is what you need to do next, next, next. And these are the options. If you don't want to do this, here's option A, B, and C. It's concrete. It's something you can get your hand on. You can actually write notes to yourself say, this is what I need to do. This is what I can expect from my doctor. Does that, all, that, does that make, make sense? It's amazing, because we have much less time to see patients now than we did two years ago. And I can tell you, two years from now, we're going to have less time to see patients. So you better get in, get your list, get to the point, say, this is what's most important for me. Let's deal with these and let's figure out what my options are. And again, as I mentioned at the bottom of this slide, uh, for non-medical issues like, in, like employment insurance, financial assistance, and social support, all of these can benefit from uh, the advice I'm giving you about shared management. I'm gonna continue the bladder issue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, play, I'm gonna do a role model with you. Okay, here's what happens before shared management. Doctor. How's your bladder doing? Patient, not great, but I guess I can live with it. You know, I do have MS. Bye, that's the end of the discussion. You go to the next issue. 
There's no action plan. There's no understanding of what's really going on. The doctor really doesn't know, but they think, well, the patient will tell me if there's something really bad, I guess. So let's keep going on because my goal here is to make sure that I go through the MRI with them, see how many new spots they have, uh, to check their blood work that they had the last time to make sure that everything is okay. That's what I'm focused on. And if they really don't care that much about the bladder, that's okay. then they must be doing okay. And I've got other things that are more important. Like I need to stop those lymphocytes from destroying the brain. Uh, and the fact is you can do both. All right, so this is somebody who really knows the shared management concept. This is how they might approach the problem. He goes to the doctor. The doctor says, how's your bladder doing? The patient says, glad you ask. I go every two hours during the day and the night. And when I go, I must go immediately or I wet myself. This creates three major concerns. Obviously, the leaking is a problem. I have to get up and run to the bathroom. Well, you know how weak and spastic I am. I can't run much, and I'll fall trying to get to the, to, the, uh, to the bathroom. And the next day, I'm totally wiped out. Uh, and, uh, and I took this online questionnaire about bladder, and it, I scored in, in the range that I need help. I need more help. And... Um, uh, and then I've tried, I've tried a lot of other things. I mean, it isn't like I'm just asking you for help. I know what I need to do. I'm drinking less coffee. I, get, I take less fluids, especially at night, things like that. And they've helped a little, but I still have a major issue. This is a major problem for me. And then last year, when you prescribed that medicine for me for my bladder, it did help. It also called blurred vision. It caused me to have blurred vision, very dry mouth, and my memory wasn't as good. And of course, I was constipated terribly after that medicine. Uh, so let's, let's step back and look at what are my options. What are other medications that maybe have fewer side effects that you might recommend? And I've read, and I've read about some of these, but I want you to know specifically, I, I want you to tell me about Botox. I want you to tell me about this. I want you to tell me about all these other things. Tell me the pros and cons. Um, and, you know, I can live with my bladder problems. I've got MS. You know, I guess you just have to live with that. But I want to discuss treatment options. So what's my next step? And have a pencil in your, or pay, pay it in your hand so you can write down the next step. Now that is a shared decision making. All of a sudden, the doctor gets engaged. He said, wow, this is serious. You know, this is really affecting this person's quality of life. How can we help? Um, and, um, and I'm just interested in, in just your thoughts about uh, how many of these problems, whether it's bowel problems, sexual dysfunction, you know, you name it, all the problems that people have really get much time, traction in the doctor's office when he's so busy thinking about MRIs and blood tests and stuff like that. Um, and so is it the doctor's fault? Maybe, but maybe not. Can you take some responsibility? Yes. Your responsibility is to know what you're talking about before you go in there. Quantify your degree of difficulty and be specific. Prioritize what's the most important thing for you to deal with because it's affecting your quality of life. And seek not sympathy, but advice. You want specific steps of what you can be doing to help you with this problem. And I'm going to give you an example when we finish. It's, it's called a search document, which was put together by the MSAA. And it's about disease-modifying therapy, but it illustrates the concept that we're talking about. So anyway, the take-home message here is shared management can help with many problems. Uh, so I'm going to stop that, stop for just a second to ask, ask questions, because it's a new concept. Uh, many doctors are used to telling patients what to do. Many patients are used to going in and talking to the doctor, and they get home, and they said, well, what did your doctor talk about? Well, I was there, I was only there for 10 minutes when they were actually there for probably 30 or 40 minutes, and he really didn't say anything. Uh, because we haven't organized the visit in such a way to get anything out of it, and the doctor's just sort of responding to the patients. You know, well, I'll talk whatever you want to talk about, okay? Uh, and you go home wondering, was that really worth the two-hour wait to see that doctor? Is there a question over here? All right, well, let's go, let's go to talk about quality of life now. Yes? Is this bladder questionnaire available online? Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised it's not here. It's on my set of slides. It's on, I mean, the, 
Is it on here? It's not. It's, is it on your uh, slides? Okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, actually, I developed it. <laughs> it was one of the things that I actually uh, developed. I was so frustrated with uh, bladder issues for MS. Yeah, it's there, and you can get a copy of it. You can talk to the MS Foundation and get a copy. You can talk to me, and I'll get you a copy. It's published. It's validated. It's standardized, and it should be at every doctor's office uh, for you to fill out while you're in the waiting room before you see the doctor. You got it. people say it, and my friend has a problem also, and he's always, I did you talk to the doctor about it, help him make a list when he goes to the doctor. Oh, we didn't get to that. So if you come in there with a form, I think the doctor will pay more attention to you. Well, I'm, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Right, so we'll get to that, is, that is available, and the MS Foundation can help you find it. I can help you find it, okay. uh, and it's been very helpful. All right, let's talk about quality of life for a minute. Um, quality of life is not a state of health, okay? I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not a physical state. It's a mental state. You're feeling, and we talked about this in my last talk or the talk before that, about uh, it's, it's how you feel about what's going on in your life. And so we need to think about the feelings and the, and the mental concept of quality of life and not say, well, if I can't run a 100-yard dash in 20 seconds, I must have a miserable quality of life. Uh, but we've all adapted. You know, as we get older, you know, you have to say, my quality of life when I was 20 is really different than my quality right now because I look at different things uh, for that. And so, uh, and I think one of the things, I'm, I'm giving you some patient quotes now that, that I consider indication of a good quality of life. I'm adapting to my illness without giving in. That's important. I'm doing the things to maximize my physical and mental functioning. I know now how to ask for and receive help when it's appropriate. My interpersonal relationships with my family and friends and coworkers are actually now very satisfactory. I've worked on that. I'm feeling productive. And I don't work for money anymore, but I'm still very, feeling very productive. Um, I'm exercising my creative juices by helping other people. In, in fascinating ways that I never thought I would do. And I see my life in my, in my glass, it's half full, not half empty. Uh, so again, I think a high quality of life is actually important and achievable with people with MS. So what creates a good quality of life? Well, the best health care, of course, both medical and, and psychological and social care. Feeling productive, having good relationships, and feeling creative. That's what I aim for when I talk to patients, when I talk about quality of life, those areas. I think the use of uh, uh, adaptive um, uh, um, concepts, uh, not traditional medicine concepts, can be very helpful. You've learned, uh, you've learned about yoga, we talked about tai chi, Water therapy, working out in the water, can be very helpful. Biofeedback, massage, self-hypnosis. We did meditation yesterday. Uh, guided imagery, spirituality. There are so many things that we talked about in the complementary and alternative medicine that are very helpful for people. And I'll just point out at the top of this slide, it says exercise was considered an alternative medicine therapy and not recommended in 1975. We were told not to exercise MS patients. Under any circumstances, you're nodding your head. You may remember those days. And I remember when I, I've set up a lot of recreational programs for MS patients uh, throughout the years. And one of the first I set up was a handicapped ski program for multiple sclerosis patients in Winter Park, Colorado. I was in Denver. And I saw all these amputees from Fitzsimmons Army Hospitals out there skiing. And I'm saying, they can ski. Why can't my MS patients? It's cool, you know, if we could do it safely. To make a long story short, I, I became a handicap instructor, so I knew what I was getting into, and we started a handicap ski program. 
we went to do a pilot study with 10 patients. And uh, so we asked the neurologist in a note out to the neurologist, uh, if they had somebody who'd be interested in doing this, please send them to the Rocky Mountain Multiple Sclerosis Center, which was what I ran at the time. And their response was they, uh, they reported me to the uh, State Medical Society and asked that my medical license be revoked. <coughs> because I was going to kill multiple sclerosis patients on the ski station. That's 1975. That's what they said. So, so the med medical board, after some discussion, said, no, it's okay. And then my colleagues, these are my friends, my students, et cetera, that I've had known for years, um, asked my medical malpractice insurance company to drop me and not cover me for medical malpractice because I was, we were all together. It was a, Colorado had, a, had a, all the doctors in one malpractice company and that it, it would bankrupt the company when all the patients sued uh, me. Uh, for causing this death and destruction for skiing. Well, just think about that. Uh, exercise is now a part of our lives uh, with multiple sclerosis. But, but it wasn't always. We've learned. All right, conserving energy is actually very important. Fatigue is the most common symptom of multiple sclerosis patients, and conserving energy is critically important. So how do you do that? Well, you plan, you make your list, I love list, and you prioritize your list, and you figure out when you're gonna do this and that. If you gotta go shopping, and you get tired at three o'clock in the afternoon, you better do your shopping in the morning. Uh, and you need to pace your activities and, and intersperse it with rest. Don't try to do three different activities uh, right after the other. Uh, stay, is, stay in a cool environment if at all possible. Use air conditioning, use cooling devices. Uh, Focus on and increasing your endurance so you get through the day. Remember, this is a, not a 100-yard dash. This is a marathon journey in life. Exercise is important. Using aids is important. Uh, avoid smoking. Uh, practice better uh, body postures. And we've, we learned a lot about body postures from Mindy this week. I think it's really important. Uh, I think that can be helpful. Your nutrition is really important. I don't like sudden weight loss programs, and when I see my patients gaining weight, I don't like that either. You need to have a balanced diet, and you've heard from um, Laura about diets, and that's very important. Ask for help. I don't know how many of my patients get in trouble because they don't ask the people who could help them the most, the people closest to them, because they don't want to bother them. So they don't bother them, and then they fall and break their hip. <laughs> and then it's a real bother, so feel free to reach out to your friends and families and uh, care providers. Uh, consider medications for fatigue. I'm, not, I'm here, not here to talk about medications, but there are medications that can help many patients with multiple sclerosis. And then make sure your doctor is looking for other causes of fatigue. As uh, the head of psychology at the Rocky Mountain MS Center would tell me, you can have fleas and ticks at the same time. So you can have fatigue and multiple sclerosis, you can have other causes of fatigue. So you need to look for anemia. Look at, is it medication related? Is it low thyroid? Is it depression? What are the other causes of fatigue? And don't just say, well, it's my multiple sclerosis. I really can't do much about that. All right, this is, this is the exercise, my exercise slide, as it went from an alternative treatment to a necessity, I think. Uh, what does it do? It maximizes your strengths, your flexibility. Uh, it improves your safety when you're walking. Um, it allows you to uh, uh, have more endurance. Uh, it decreases fatigue. It manages weight. It improves circulation. It improves bowel function. Uh, it reduces depression and anxiety. It improves your sleep. It helps to prevent bed sores if you're, if you're confined to bed. Um, and I, overall, it enhances the quality of life. So if there's one of the few messages I'm going to give to you today is, is try to incorporate an exercise program in your lifestyle. So this is the game plan uh, to maximize the quality of life. And I'll call it Dr. Burks's game plan. And I'm going to end this part of the talk with this. Uh, yeah, I think we've still got time to do this. Um, and I'm going to call it my 10-step program. And step one. Become knowledgeable. Become a knowledgeable consumer of your own health. We've talked about that. Number two, if 
find out the resources that are available to you, how they can help you, how you can access them. Now I'm talking about healthcare professionals. If you and your doctor aren't seeing eye to eye and he's not listening to you or she's not listening to you, do something about it. Um, and uh, use psychologists, use rehabilitation, use the MS societies, use employment counselors if necessary, use social workers, and use the internet carefully. So that's what you can do as far as looking at resources, as far, and I'm probably missing a few, and I'd be happy to have you add to that. Third is maintain your individual identity. Don't fall into the victim trap. I can't help myself, I'm just a victim. Uh, you need to take control of your life and keep control. Keep life goals, establish them, change them as necessary, but have goals to, to work by. Just say, this oh poor me is, is, is the least helpful thing you could do right now. Don't hibernate. So many people become socially isolated. I have MS. I don't want to see people, I don't want people to see me limp. I'm afraid I'll have a, uh, an accident uh, with my bladder, et cetera. Uh, you need to stay involved with the real world. And there are ways technology is available to give you the ways to, to stay involved. Next part of that, if you're, this is your individual identity, is don't accept no. <laughs> you know, the question if they say, you can't do that, your question back is, uh, what modifications are needed to let me do that? They, no is not an option here. It's tell me the modifications so that I can do that. And if it's to do skiing, well, is there a way to modify it? If it's to go fishing, is there a way to modify it? Is there a way to go to a department store to get up that which doesn't have elevators or escalators? Uh, well, there's a service elevator in the back. I, ha but I want to get there. If I have to get to the third floor, tell me how to do that. What do I need to do? Those are examples. Number four, develop better coping and adapting skills. The one thing to get through this life's journey with multiple sclerosis, you've got to learn to be a good adapter and be able to cope with issues. And keep your head on straight and say, this is what I need to do, and I realize that I may have to make some adjustments as well to cope and adapt. Appro number five, improve your ability to deal with stress. Uh, whether you have MS or not, this life is full of stressors. MS just adds to it. And everybody should have stress management in some life, whether they have MS or not. But with MS, it's especially important because the stressors are important. And people get angry. Patients get angry. Care providers get angry. Uh, uh, friends and family get angry. You gotta learn how to deal with that. You can't say, I'm just gonna avoid that. No, you can't avoid stress, so learn how to deal with it. Maintain a healthy lifestyle. Take responsibility for your own health. And we're talking about diet, exercise, rest, recreational activities, you know, going to the movies, going swimming, uh, horseback riding. There's so many opportunities to have recreational activities, and they make such a difference in people's lives. The, the, uh, probably the number one thing I think you should think about is going on another cruise with the MS Foundation, because <laughs> what, what a great relaxation exercise week this has been. You've made lots of friends, you've done lots of interesting things, and they're lifetime memories. Don't, don't deny yourself those memories. Avoid toxins. Really watch your alcohol. Stop smoking, and don't, you know, 30% uh, of MS patients smoke. Uh, it's sad. Alcohol, I don't say you can't drink alcohol, but, be, but modify it in a way that it doesn't disrupt your lifestyle. Learn your safety zones and your to tolerance limits. Like for example, let's say you're gonna go out tonight. You wanna go to the movie. Uh, and you know that if you stay up past 10 o'clock, you're wiped out the next day. So go to the seven o'clock movie. You know, what are your safety zones? Now, I can go out for this long, so I don't want to go to dinner and a movie, so I'll go to one or the other, because that's within my safety zone. Number seven, evaluate your friends. This is tough. I didn't used to say this, but I believe it now, and you may disagree with me. You know, reach out to your supportive friends. Keep those as your supportive friends. That's the easy part. The other part is to evaluate your other, quote, friends who drain you. And you have people who, who take up your time and just drain you and give nothing back. And there are takers. Uh, 
you got you to gotta figure out what, I, what you want to do with those. My strong advice is to look for people who are supportive and not people who drain you. And take your losses and move away from those. Do you agree? Absolutely. All right. Um, I'm not telling you to, dit to ditch your friends, but I'm telling you just to ditch your, your friends that are not supportive. <laughs> Reach out to peers with MS. You know, you have co common issues, you have common goals. Advocate for MS causes. There are so many ways that you can help the MS world uh, by doing this. And some people say, no, I don't want to be around the MS patients. And that, uh, that's fine. I'm, I have to accept that. But there are many other ways to stay involved in the MS world. Number nine, don't just have healthcare professionals. Develop a partnership with them. And that, that's not easy to do. It takes a while. But the ones who do it successfully, they feel their doctor and their therapist and their uh, psychologist, whatever, are their partners. They really develop this, uh, this relationship with them. Um, and it's a lifelong relationship for most people. I'm very concerned about the new health care reform is that you're going to have to be switching doctors in spite of what our president said. Uh, I think that's a disaster for people with chronic illness and for MS especially. Because you've got a good doctor and you trust that person, the nurses in that office are your best friends, you can call them and ask them for anything. That's, that's invaluable. So try to keep those healthcare professionals. I think you should consider, if you have relapsing disease, I think you should consider immune therapy as soon as possible after the diagnosis because I think it's the best way to reduce your chances of having disease progression later. And then explore treatments for a variety of symptoms, and these are just some of them. Number 10, focus on your quality of life and not your MS. Visualize yourself as normal with some limitations, not as somebody with multiple sclerosis. Uh, it, it changes the way you look at the world, I think. And remember, if we look at quality of life, quality of life starts with th the best medical care. And then you go up to feeling productive, having good relationships, and feeling creative. And that, uh, and there, even if you don't have a cure for progressive multiple sclerosis, you can work on these other things that even have higher value for quality of life. So my challenge to you is what can you do today to start improving your quality of life? And you have the handouts. If you want bigger uh, copies of those, let uh, Alan or his staff know, and, and they can get those to you. Um, and I end with happiness is a state of mind, not a state of health. I have, just, I have a few minutes left, right? Because I'd like to go through another slide set uh, if we have time. Um, I hit escape, right? I'm going to switch here. I go to escape. As you can see, I'm not computer literate, but I'm going to do my best here. I'm going to go through the search document from the MSAA. Uh, and there'll be more documents like this from the MS Coalition, uh, which, um, which uh, the MS Foundation is, is an integral part of. And this talks about how do you find out which disease-modifying therapy is best for you? Because uh, most people don't know. And they say, well, it's, well, that's the doctor. He'll know. No, he won't know. Because uh, he's going to want your input. And the key is, how do you frame the discussion to doctors? Now, doctors are these half fluting guys who use all these 15-syllable words uh, and confuse you to death. So how do you control that conversation? And, that, um, and so framing the discussion is very important. And you can read this. You have a handout for this, and you can read it. I'm not going to go into the, the details of this uh, at this amount of time. But I had some notes to myself. I wanted to emphasize a few things. Um, and um, I'm going to keep going here. Uh, and you'll have these. What does search mean? Well, it's, it's a, an acronym. S stands for safety, E stands for effectiveness, A stands for affordability, R stands for risk, C stands for convenience, and H stands for health outcomes. What do we mean when we, when we say these things? Uh, because if you don't know how to ask about these, the chances are the doctor won't know what you're asking about. So this actually gives you a way of saying, these are the issues that I want to cover with him. And then how do we cover it? Now I'm going to just finish. I'm going to go ahead. 
And what we've done here is we've actually given you the questions to ask that doctors will understand exactly what you mean. Because how many times do your doctor say, I'm not sure what that means. What, what, what are you really saying? So these are the questions. Now, you don't have to ask any one of these questions. But you can pick out the questions. And you'll develop other questions by looking at these questions. Say, well, this is how I'd like to frame that question for the doctor. So there are oh, three or four questions on each of the topics of safety, effectiveness, affordability, uh, risk, convenience, and health outcomes. Um, but what you want to do is you want to be able to, to talk about when should you start a disease-modifying therapy. And obviously, my idea is the sooner the better. How do I choose disease-modifying therapies? That's the next issue, once you've decided to do it. And these will give you guidelines of how to do that. And then, and then the next question is, how do you determine if this is the most successful, most effective drug for you? Uh, is it really effective, or is it really OK, but it's really not suboptimal? It's what I call a suboptimal response. And then, if you feel it's suboptimal, and you and the doctor feel that way, then you uh, say, how do I choose the next step, the next treatment for me? Because you've got 9 or 10 treatments for multiple sclerosis. You'll find one that's going to work for you. And it may not be the first one. So you've got to figure out how to do that. And you establish that relationship to, uh, to compare the various medications um, and compare what your risk tolerance is. Some people say, doctor, you can cut off my arm. Just give me the most powerful drug. I don't care. What happens? I want the most powerful. And some will say, well, doctor, you know, I've got a young family. I've got to worry about infections. Will I get cancer? Uh, I want to become pregnant again. Which of these are the most the biggest issues there? Uh, I've heard that some cause anemia, some cause thyroid problems. Doctor, help me with that and let me determine what's the best choice for me. And, and I'm going to open it up for questions though. But the key is, is well, I'm trying to get you to be the best consumer of your own health care. That's what I'm really trying to do here. Uh, and I'm getting you to try to prioritize your issues and, that, uh, and how you can direct the conversation to doctors. Because the doctors has just seen three other patients. They've got three more patients or ten more patients they after you. You know, he said, okay, well, what, what are the issues here? You know? And so you tell him what the issues are, and you become knowledgeable about it. And then you can direct what's best for you. But just remember, what you think is best for you may be not what the doctor thinks is best for you. But if you talk to him, in a way, with asking these sort of questions, all of a sudden he'll get it. He'll say, oh, well, that's much more important to them than it is to me. You know, or what, what do you care about pregnancy? <laughs> you know, you can always stop these medicines or something like that, but that's a big issue for some people. And when that doctor knows it's a big issue for you, he'll say, no, maybe there's another one here that's a little safer on that end uh, so we can try. Uh, any questions? We have uh, 10 minutes for questions? Uh, we were supposed to stop at 11.30? 11.45. Okay, so we have about 10 more minutes for questions. Yes, sir. I saw your hand up here earlier. All right. I want to give a chance to talk to you about some of what your issues are, but this is sort of my perspective. Now I'll be interested in your perspective and your questions. Yes, sir. The new oral drugs, for example, um, can you give us a feel for how much more effective they are than interferons? Um, you know, we see, see a lot of various charts, but... I'm not sure, you know, if it's worth pursuing a, a switch to, you know, when part of that may be the information you just presented. So. Well, my feeling is if the shoe fits, wear it. If it fits you and you're doing well, uh, why would you change? If, if you're tolerating the drug well and you're not having attacks and you're not having new lesions on your MRI stuff, so... I look at people to change when they have a, what I call a suboptimal response or they're intolerant to the current medications they are because these drugs have not been tested head to head. And the tests that we did in the 1990s for some of these drugs, these were different patients than we're seeing now. They were much sicker, they were much less likely to respond, so therefore uh, uh, this much difference back then, the same drug given in, to, this, to a group of patients who are newly diagnosed might have this good of results. So you cannot compare apples to oranges. Drug companies would like for you to do that. 
that we're better than they are, da da da. But until they give me comparative trials, uh, I'm not sure we're looking at the same patient population. And that all I know is that uh, the people on beta serum in the first trial, started in 1988, they were on the drug for five years or they were on placebo. The next 16 years, they were on anything they wanted to be on. At the end of those 21 years, the patients who got treated with beta serum in the first five years versus placebo had a 50% less mortality rate. Big deal, big deal. It's an important drug. It helps a lot of people for the right people. And some people don't tolerate it. Some people don't do very well on interferons. Um, but the fact is, is if you've got a winner, be careful about changing mechanisms. All these drugs work differently. They have different what we call mechanisms of action. Right. And you may have to go through a series of, of drugs and I've had patients who've gone from, say, from an interferon to copaxone uh, because of what, for whatever reason, and they went back and it didn't work as well. They had trouble with, with copaxone, and they went back to interferons, didn't get the same results that they were having before. So you have to look at that. Now, that's, the, that's my pitch for you don't have to change therapies <laughs> if you're doing well. Now I'm going to give you the pitch for the new treatments. Uh, first of all, Oral drugs are, uh, are more convenient. They're not necessarily less toxic. I mean, some of the oral drugs you have to be very careful with. Some of the oral drugs have toxicities that you have to worry about. Uh, there is one study of Gelenia versus Avonex that showed it had 50% fewer relapses. Now, there's the, that's the head-to-head -head trial. That's the sort of data I'm looking at. But it, uh, and those were done with the same group of patients. Uh, they weren't comparing Avonex patients 20 years ago to Avonex patients today. No, they were doing them today. So I think there probably is a difference in efficacy with some of these, but we need comparative trials to be absolutely certain. And that uh, I have people, I think Jelenia is a great drug. I think Tecfidera is a great drug. Some people can't tolerate either. So you have to say, what are the tolerabilities? And but I've seen failures on every drug. I've seen failures on Tasabri. I've seen failures on everything. And I've seen people who have been on beta serum, which is the first drug out, for 21 years now. And they've been doing fabulously. <laughs> and they were doing really badly before they started it. So that's why you need a relationship with your doctor to talk about each of these in the areas that what concerns you, et cetera, et cetera. Just because it's oral doesn't mean it's not toxic. And just because it's old doesn't mean it's no good. Uh, but the new drugs uh, are very powerful, and many of them are oral. And so uh, somebody says, I don't want to take shots anymore. I've been taking Copaxone for 10 years. Uh, one shot a day for uh, 365 days a year is th over 3,000 shots. Maybe I'll do something else. But now Copaxone is out for three times a week. So. The companies are working in that way as well. So uh, I think the new drugs are, uh, the data looks really good on the new drugs. That's what I'll say. And the data looks better than the old drugs, but they're different patients. So I can't be 100% certain until they do head-to-head -head trials for those. I think that um, uh, one of the most powerful drugs that I've ever seen is Lemtrada. Uh, it's a drug that the FDA just turned down accepted in 30 countries, but not this country, because uh, they didn't like the way the study was done. And I think that's really sad, because I think my patients need the choice, and I need the choice, because this drug may be very helpful to certain patients, but not everybody, but certain patients. I want more drugs. I want more choices to take, and I really don't like somebody else telling me that uh, you don't have the option of using this drug for certain patients. Does that answer your question? Does it? Excellent. Thank you. Okay, certainly. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, one of the earlier slides you said to start immune therapy as soon as possible. Yeah. Is it the same as the DMT? Yeah. Uh, all disease modifying therapies currently affect the immune system. Okay. All of them do. I thought so, but I just wanted yeah. to make sure. It's considered an, an immunologic disease. We may have treatments in the future that are not immunologic, but right now the ones that are FDA approved are all immunologic okay. treatments. Like CCSVI is not an immunologic treatment. It turns out it didn't work, <laughs> you know. So after all the hype, they finally did the study uh, and showed that uh, it was not effective. Uh, 
in the, in, uh, the majority of patients. Now, there are still some people who say my fatigue is less. And then you have to separate a disease-modifying therapy versus a symptomatic therapy. And, uh, and so, you understand what I mean? Yes. Yes. I recommend they read my book. <laughs> I recommend they get a copy of my slides about what I think is important. What I really hate is when doctors tell people, you've got primary progressive disease or secondary progressive disease, there's nothing I can do. I don't even know why you're coming to me. There's nothing I can do for you. Well, if you look at what that book says, and what I'm saying, the number of ways, we're talking about quality of life. He's talking about the immune system. You're talking about quality of life. You're talking about reducing bladder infections. You're talking about increasing your sexual function. You're increasing all these other things that doctors don't think about. They think about those lymphocytes. Uh, and that's why in shared decision making, you bring the other perspective, the human perspective, into the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And almost every type of symptomatic problems people have, there are ways to deal with. The rehabilitation therapists are terrific at, uh, and, and helping people in a variety of ways. Right, so. and, and I understand that, and you know, for all the symptoms that he has from it, that's great. But in the back of my mind, I just feel like there's a clock that's ticking. And every day that passes that we, there's not something out there to help him with a better quality of life and to stop this disease from progressing. Well, one of the reasons I gave my last talk, I think there were over 20 therapies that are in trials for progressive disease. And some of those are going to be done by the end in a year or two. And some of the others are going to be done in two or three years. So the clock is ticking. But I can tell you, it was like in 1992 when we knew we had a bunch of people on trials with beta seron. We were just hoping that this would be the answer. And it was a tremendous benefit to patients. I feel the same way about primary progressive disease. I think we're really close. Uh, we've got trials going on. It is. It used to be when I wrote that textbook, it was theory. We didn't even, you know, that was only like two years ago. And in the last couple of years, the interest in progressive disease has increased dramatically. We've always had the interest. We didn't have the knowledge or the technology to to uh, test out our theories. Now we do. And uh, I think you'll be, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, treatment for progressive disease. Yes, can I ask one more? One quick one. Okay, yes, one quick one. Uh, We're over time. My question is simply about the new protocol for Capaxone. Is that three days a week, like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing, or do you have to regulate the days like every other day and alternate which days of the week you're I, taking it? My, I don't know. It, I haven't read the FDA. It came out while I was on the cruise. So I haven't always seen what the FDA's. My thought is, you take it three times a week. I don't care how you take it. You know, but if, you, if you want to take it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I think as long as you're uh, getting it three times a week, is the you'll FDA be fine. The the same, or is it better? Or it, well, the FDA looked the same. And again, I haven't seen the FDA release, but the FDA looked uh, comparable. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, they couldn't sell it if it were not as effective. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, it'd be, yeah. It, it, the data that I saw was comparable. The two were comparable. Thank you so very much. It's been a pleasure to be here.